It was 1 a.m. on August 15, 1982, in Washington Park, Chicago, when a hail of bullets killed 19-year-old Marilyn Green and 18-year-old Jerry Hillard in front of a crowd of witnesses. The killer ended up getting away from the crime scene, but people had seen him pull the trigger. A 28-year-old man, Anthony Porter, became the center of it all. He looked like an insane man who murdered the young couple without any clear motive. The investigation and trial didn't take time to convict him. After spending years in prison, 44-year-old Anthony was supposed to be executed just two days from now. He was dangling by the thread and deciding on his last meal. However, just hours before his scheduled execution, a dramatic twist intervened. Anthony's imminent death sentence was halted. What was this unexpected revelation? Was this secret going to save Anthony or implicate him more? It was a warm summer night in Chicago on August 14, 1982. It was the night of the Bud Billiken Parade and Picnic, a huge celebration for the African-American community. Even into the early hours of August 15th, the excitement continued at Washington Park. The weather was hot and everyone was trying to cool down. Joining in the festivities that night were two young lovebirds, 19-year-old Marilyn Green and 18-year-old Jerry Hillard, who were in love and planning to get married. They decided to have a little adventure by sneaking into the pool area at Washington Park, and they found their way to the top of the bleachers on the western side of the pool, enjoying their time together. As the night got closer to 1 a.m., a dreadful event unfolded. A person with a gun approached the young couple and fired shots with a 38 caliber revolver. Jerry was hit in the head by two bullets, and Marilyn, in her attempt to shield herself, was shot twice in the neck and once in the hand. With blood flowing from her wounds, Marilyn somehow managed to leave the park holding her neck with her hand and pointing the left hand in the air, indicating the direction the killer had run away to. Luckily, there was a patrol car nearby with Officer Anthony Liacci in it, who responded to the shots fired call. He'd stopped a young black man running from the scene, but there were more pressing matters to attend to. Marilyn was practically carrying her head at that point. She was immediately taken to the hospital, but the injuries were just too severe, and she passed away before the sun came up. Detectives Geraldine Perry and Dennis Dwyer initiated an investigation into the double murder of Jerry Hillard and Marilyn Green. They understood that there were too many people around for the killer to have escaped unnoticed. Focusing on potential witnesses William Taylor and Henry Williams, who were near the bleachers, the detectives brought them to the precinct for questioning. There, their case was assigned to Detective Charles Salvatore and his longtime partner, Detective Dennis Gray. Medical examiner Joanne Richmond determined Marilyn's cause of death as severe blood loss, while Jerry's fatal headshot wound indicated no chance of survival. A mysterious black powdery substance on Jerry's hand raised further questions. Back at the station, questioning began for Henry Williams, who told the detectives that on the night of the double murder, he'd been mugged by a man named Anthony Porter. Born on December 14, 1954, Anthony Porter, raised by a single mother in a housing project, had eight siblings. He was a familiar face to police. He was involved in criminal activities as a Cobra Stones gang member and was known for robbing in Washington Park. On probation in 1979, he violated it with a robbery. After admitting guilt in 1980, he served a one-year prison term and two years on parole. During parole, he pointed a gun at a man named Earl Lewis resulting in a gun incident and a subsequent jail term for aggravated battery. Anthony was sent to jail again. In the interrogation room, Witness Williams initially described a gun incident involving Anthony, but didn't witness the shooting. Another witness, Taylor, initially claimed not to see the perpetrator, but later changed his story, identifying Anthony after prolonged questioning. Despite lack of proof, Anthony was arrested. Now, it was all dependent on the courthouse battle between the prosecutors and his defense team. Back in the interrogation room, one of the main witnesses, Williams, explained that Anthony pointed a gun at him and took two dollars. Then he saw Anthony going up to the bleachers, but didn't witness the actual shooting. But that wasn't the end of it. He said that his friend, William Taylor, had seen a man kill Jerry and Marilyn. However, there was just one problem. 
Taylor was too scared of Anthony Porter to talk. The detectives took the two witnesses to a fried chicken place called Harold's. During their meal, Taylor said he didn't see the person who did it, but later at the police station, he changed his story. After 17 hours of questioning, Taylor's story went from not seeing the person responsible to clearly stating he saw Anthony shoot the victims. The police had already zeroed in on Anthony Porter, who they believed was the real killer. When he heard the police brought up his name in relation to the shootings, he thought the best thing to do was to go to the police station to prove he had nothing to do with it. But instead of being set free, Anthony was arrested. He denied having anything to do with the incident, and there was no actual proof linking him to the crime, but there was nothing he could do. Now it was all dependent on the courthouse battle between the prosecutors and his defense team. In court, Prosecutor Paul Sigetvari presented 14 witnesses, including Henry Williams, who spoke of being robbed by Anthony, and William Taylor, who testified about seeing Anthony shoot Jerry Hillard, but clarified he didn't witness Marilyn's murder. Patrolman Anthony Liacci suggested Anthony might have been the runner he encountered, but never filed a report, leaving the gun's whereabouts uncertain. He also didn't find a gun on the person he thought was Anthony, implying that if this individual was the real killer of Jerry and Marilyn, they'd managed to hide the weapon somewhere in the pool area, and the police had failed to locate it. Even though he was eligible for a public defender, his family had decided to hire a private lawyer, Akeem Gersil, for $10,000, but they could only pay him $3,000. Even so, the defense, led by Anthony's attorney, Akeem Gersil, was well prepared for the trial. They had strong testimony from Georgia Moody, who was the longtime girlfriend of one of Anthony's brothers. Moody's testimony placed Anthony at his mother's apartment all day on August 14, 1982. She stated that he didn't leave until around 2.30 a.m. on August 15. Another defense witness, Anthony's friend Kenneth Doyle, confirmed that Anthony was at the apartment and mentioned that they went to a nearby Project House playground together, where they continued drinking until dawn. Doyle also emphasized that he, Jerry Hillard, and Anthony Porter were all members of the Cobra Stones gang. He questioned why one member would kill another. Anthony's defense team really thought they would win the case, but they couldn't have been more wrong. In September of 1983, after discussing for nine long hours, the jury declared Anthony guilty of two murder charges as well as armed robbery, unlawful restraint, and two counts for unlawfully using weapons. Consequently, on September 9, 1983, Anthony Porter was sentenced to death. He was then transferred to Maynard Correctional Center downstate, where the notorious serial killer John Wayne Gacy was in a nearby cell. But neither Anthony nor his family could just sit around and wait for the execution. They wanted to make appeals. Kenneth Flaxman, the experienced lawyer who took on Anthony Porter's case on appeal, saw many problems with the initial conviction. There was no solid evidence, no murder weapon, and Anthony had always said he was innocent. The eyewitness testimonies were not very convincing and seemed like they might have been influenced or forced. Everything was based on flimsy circumstantial evidence. But Flaxman had a theory. The police were determined to put Anthony behind bars and had used this case to achieve just that. Over 10 years, he'd filed several legal motions direct appeal, writ of habeas corpus, petition for post-conviction relief, but all were rejected. By 1998, it seemed like Anthony had run out of options. The state had set a date for his execution. It was going to be September 23, 1998. Anthony's family was desperate, and they turned to a young attorney named Daniel Sanders for help. Sanders had graduated from law school a few years earlier, and he'd taken on various legal jobs even working on appeals for death row cases because they paid well. He agreed to represent him for a fee of $25,000. It's unknown how this fee was supposed to be paid. Sanders reached out to another lawyer, Aviva Futorian, for guidance, as he was less experienced with death penalty law. Futorian encouraged him to get an evaluation of Anthony's mental abilities. If Sanders could show that Anthony had mental disabilities, meaning he couldn't fully understand his involvement or lack thereof in the shooting, it could potentially save Anthony from the death penalty. Only a few hours were left before his scheduled execution. 
Four additional volunteer lawyers, including Sanders, took up Anthony's case and had his IQ tested, which turned out to be 51, indicating intellectual disability. At that time, it was still legal to execute someone with intellectual disabilities, but Anthony's legal team argued that his limited mental capacity meant he couldn't fully grasp the consequences of his punishment, making him ineligible for execution. Only 50 hours before his scheduled execution, the Illinois Supreme Court granted a temporary halt. This was a relief, but the execution could potentially continue if they didn't build a strong case. In late August 1998, Aviva Futorian, who knew Professor David Protes from previous wrongful conviction cases, reached out to him. He declined to take on the case. However, things took a positive turn when the Illinois Supreme Court's decision came for a hearing on Anthony's mental competency and granted a four-month stay of execution. Futorian updated protests on these developments, and he scheduled the case for his next seminar, The News Media and Capital Punishment. In the fall of 1998, Professor Protus's class of 16 had an interesting choice to make. They could pick from four different cases to work on, but one of them was particularly tricky because it was a new case. Four students named Sean Armbrust, Lori D'Angelo, Tom McCann, and Kara Rubinsky stepped up to take on this challenge. Professor Protus gave them some documents and phone numbers, hoping they'd be able to get some information. Their mission was to dig into the case of Marilyn Green and Jerry Hillard, a case that was 16 years old. But Professor Protus was upfront about the uncertainty of saving Anthony Porter from execution. Yet the students were determined. As they delved into police reports and court records, they became convinced that Anthony Porter deserved a fresh trial. They started by visiting Daniel Sanders, Anthony's lawyer who'd been conducting his own research. Among the stacks of documents he'd examined, they discovered a significant set of papers. Ken Flaxman, who'd previously represented Porter, had gathered many sworn statements from people connected to Marilyn Green and Jerry Hillard. At each stage, the case was getting trickier, and this was just the start. In those documents, they found hidden clues. A witness named Joyce Haywood revealed that Jerry and Marilyn had gone to the park with Inez Jackson and her boyfriend. Ofra Green, Marilyn Green's mother, suggested to the police that Inez Jackson, who knew Marilyn, might have lured her to Washington Park to set her up for a robbery. She also mentioned that she believed Inez's boyfriend was the one who shot Marilyn and Jerry. She believed Inez's boyfriend had a conflict with Jerry over drug money. She also remembered seeing Inez and her boyfriend with Marilyn and Jerry earlier that evening. For the detectives who were carrying out this initial investigation, this was yet another angle to check. However, this task would prove to be very difficult. Before the shootings, Inez lived in a building on South Federal Street in Chicago with her four children. The day after the shooting, she moved away from the housing project. Marilyn's mother, Ofra, didn't know where Inez was at that time or if she was still alive. The same went for her boyfriend. Another witness, Ricky Young, had also testified that Jerry was involved in selling drugs for Inez's boyfriend and there'd been a dispute over drug money. Several other witnesses confirmed this version of events. The case was getting even more complicated, but soon the detectives found out the name of Inez's boyfriend. It was Alstory Simon. Like Inez, Alstory had apparently left Chicago after the murders. After some efforts, the police were able to track them both down. The officers started questioning Inez and Alstory, but they had only shown them a photo of Anthony and asked if they had information about the crime. Alstory and Inez claimed they weren't at Washington Park on the evening of the crime. At this, the officers decided to not only wrap up this line of questioning, but also dust any and every suspicion on them under the carpet. Inez and Alstory were never interviewed again, and they moved to Milwaukee a few days later. After these developments in the case, when Professor Protus noticed that they were making progress, he decided to bring in a private investigator, Paul Cialino, to speak with William Taylor, who was one of the main witnesses. Paul Cialino, accompanied by one of the students, Tom, went to Taylor's house, where he confessed everything. On December 14, 1998, 
Taylor provided a sworn statement stating that he had not seen Anthony Porter shoot anyone at Washington Park's pool that evening and that the Chicago Police Department had pressured, threatened, and intimidated him into naming Anthony. I did not see Anthony Porter shoot anyone. I was threatened, harassed, and intimidated. With this revelation, they now needed to find the suspected real culprit, All Story Simon. The only way to reach him was through Inez Jackson. To reach her, they had to get in contact with Walter Jackson, who happened to be her nephew and was serving time at the Danville Correctional Center for first-degree murder. On January the 8th, 1999, the students visited Walter in prison, where he shared the entire story that he'd been hiding all these years. In 1982, he'd been living with All Story Simon and Inez Jackson when he was a runaway. On the evening of the crime, he overheard All Story talking about his plan to meet Jerry Hillard and Marilyn Green. Jerry owed All Story money for drugs, which All Story was supplying Jerry to sell. Walter suspected that something bad might happen because of All Story's strange behavior when he left the apartment that evening. A few hours later, All Story returned and took Walter aside. He confessed to Walter that he'd taken care of Jerry and Marilyn by shooting them near the bleachers in Washington Park with a 38 caliber revolver. All Story was scared that Jerry's street gang might retaliate so he wanted someone to know what had happened. The next day, All Story told Walter they needed to leave Chicago until things calmed down. They had the story, but they needed to get to All Story, as well as Inez Jackson, which proved to be a challenge. They thought they were at a dead end. However, the students got a lucky break when they discovered Inez's real name was Margaret Simon. They tracked her down through a close relative and arranged a meeting with her Investigator Cialino and Professor Protus at a local restaurant in Milwaukee. Margaret revealed that on the evening of the Bud Billiken Parade in 1982, she went to Washington Park with Allstory, Jerry, and Marilyn. Before coming to the park, Allstory had been complaining all day about the money Jerry owed him. He arrived at the park under the influence of marijuana and alcohol. After about 20 minutes, Allstory and Jerry got into an argument about the money. Suddenly, gunshots rang out. All Story grabbed Margaret and quickly led her away from the bleachers. Margaret couldn't share the truth because All Story had threatened her life. She signed an affidavit, and the team later recorded her story on video, which was released to CBS News. And do you realize who shot them? He did, because he was the only one standing there. And he is? All Story Simon. With each development, the case introduced new twists, and there were more to come. Cialino traveled to Milwaukee to talk to All Story Simon about the case. At first, he denied any involvement, but while Cialino was there, they saw Margaret Simon's confession on the news. He realized there was no point hiding it anymore, and finally admitted that he shot both Jerry and Marilyn because he thought Jerry was reaching for a gun, and he did it to defend himself. Mr. Simon, directing your attention back to August of 1982, do you know an individual by the name of Jerry Hiller? Well, I don't know his last name, but I do know his name, Jerry. Can you tell me how you knew him? Uh, he was a person that was selling drugs for me. Okay. And while you were in the bleachers, did something else happen? Yeah, when, uh, when, we, when I started asking him uh, about uh, just my finances, uh, he began to get a little loud, and uh, I said, well, man, uh, what, what the hell has been gotten into you, you know? And then uh, by that time, you know, he said, well, it's on, you know, and then he went down, like, inside of his shirt, like, you know, like he had a gun or something. How, how did he do that, Al? Yeah, he went down like he had a gun and a shoulder holster. Before I knew anything, you know, like, I, I just pulled it up and started shooting. Now, uh, what kind of weapon did you have? I had a 38. Was that a revolver? Yes, it was. Okay. With this new development, the nightmare was finally over for Anthony Porter, who was still on death row for the crime he never committed. In February 1999, the Cook County State's Attorney filed a motion to release Anthony Porter. Judge Thomas Fitzgerald granted the motion, stating that there were significant evidentiary developments that raised doubts about Anthony's guilt. On February 5, 1999, Anthony Porter was exonerated and was released from prison on bail after 17 long years. 
When he got out, he immediately went and hugged Professor Protas for all the help he provided. I'm absolutely thrilled and ecstatic that an innocent man is going to be walking to freedom and having played some role in that just makes me feel exhilarated. Anthony alleged that the prison guard subjected him to both physical and mental abuse, and to make things even worse, he discovered crushed cockroaches in his meals. I got railroaded, tortured. Anthony Porter's exoneration in March 1999 played a crucial role in changing how Illinois dealt with the death penalty. His case revealed major problems in the state's death penalty system. By that time, Illinois had executed 12 people, but had also released 13 individuals who were wrongfully convicted. In January 2000, Governor George Ryan took a significant step by halting all executions in the state. This marked a turning point in Illinois' approach to capital punishment. I'm commuting the sentence of all death row inmates. 167 of them. In the meantime, on September 7, 1999, All Story Simon pleaded guilty to both murders and received a 37-year prison sentence. But the case was far from being over. There was yet another twist waiting to be unfolded. Years passed. All Story was in prison, but there was a significant turn of events. In 2005, Inez Jackson, who was very ill and near death, admitted that she and her nephew, Walter, had made up stories to get help from Professor Protus in order to free Inez's own son, Sonny Jackson, and nephew, Walter Jackson, from prison. But Inez, you never saw Al Story Simon shoot Marilyn and Jerry, did you? No. So if you told the news media that, that would be one of the things that would not be true, right? Right. Was there a reason why you continue telling people that you had seen Al Story Simon shoot and kill Marilyn and Jerry? Is there a reason why you continue doing that? I guess I was still mad at him. Okay, and I think you also told us about this conversation where Walter told you that if you helped David protest free Anthony Porter, that David protest would help Walter, right? Right, yes. All Story took back his confession too and claimed that he was pressured into making a false statement by two men who pretended to be city police officers. They showed him a fake witness video that framed him for the crime. They promised him a short prison sentence and a movie deal if he confessed. This led to a new investigation, which dragged on for about a decade. Amid ongoing accusations, Professor Protest resigned from the university, and in 2014, he became the head of the Chicago Innocence Project. Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez conducted a year-long review of Allstory's case. She dropped the charges against him, ending his 37-year sentence in October 2014, ordering his release from prison after he'd already served 15 years. As you may know, Mr. Simon had pled guilty to these charges in 1999 in connection with the murders of Jerry Hillard and Marilyn Green, which occurred on August 15, 1982. After pleading guilty to these crimes in 1999, Mr. Simon has been serving his sentence until today. Even though Mr. Simon is due to be released in less than three years, justice compels that I take action today. The decision to vacate these convictions comes as a result of a year-long comprehensive investigation into the facts of this case conducted by my Conviction Integrity Unit. In 2001, Anthony sued the city of Chicago for $24 million, but he lost the case. All Story then filed a federal civil rights suit against the Northwestern University Innocence Project and received an undisclosed amount as settlement. Anthony Porter struggled to adjust to life after his release. When he was declared innocent by the governor, he received a restitution check for $145,875, a sum far less than what he believed he deserved for his years in prison. 
Sadly, the money quickly disappeared, spent on a fancy SUV, gifts for friends and supporters, and alcohol. Not long after being freed, he faced an arrest for assaulting his daughter and her mother. However, this time, he was able to avoid jail time. He moved in with his mother and spent most of his days on the couch watching daytime TV. Frustrated, he told a visiting reporter, All I wanted was to get home. Then I got to go home. I feel like I'm going through the same thing as before. I just want to get a life. Whether or not he ever got a life is just another mystery as the original double murder mystery of 1982. The question of who killed Jerry and Marilyn that night still remains unanswered. The case began with Jerry and Marilyn, but after almost half a century now, to most, except their family, the memory of that young couple's tragic end in Washington Park has faded away. With all the legal twists and turns, wrongful convictions, and changes over the years, it seems like people don't even know who they're supposed to consider victims in the story. This case was like no other we've covered before. But given what we know, who do you think killed Jerry and Marilyn? Who do you think was lying, All Story Simon or Anthony Porter? Please keep the conversation going in the comment section below. Also, if you have any case suggestions you'd like us to cover, please let us know. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe.